Well, good morning, church, and uh, all appropriate greetings for this holiday weekend. You know, it occurred to me that uh, a lot of times, traditionally, people go camping on the 4th of July, and we decided to do it as a church. So here we are, <laughs> camping out a little bit, and all thanks and kudos to those who made it happen. But uh, this is a time when we, uh, historically, uh, when, when, when we celebrate those radical concepts of, of liberty, of personal freedom and individual responsibility, which have so defined and animated this republic, this God-blessed republic, for, for two and a half centuries. But in so doing, we who see all things through a biblical worldview happily acknowledge the providential goodness of God in supplying all of that. And, and quite frankly, I think it's fair to say that there are those of us who watch with heavy hearts as those freedoms are eroded and uh, those values are rejected, those values so necessary to living it out. But in either case, whether celebrating God's good gifts or bemoaning their demise, as it were, we fix our hope, we, we carefully and deliberately fix our hope and our devotion on the one who, after all, is the giver of all good gifts and on his son who happily promised us that he, whom the son, if, if the son sets you free, then you are free indeed. So just as we look to our God and his Messiah, as our only hope of true and, and enduring freedom. So some 3,000 years ago did, did, did the author of the psalm we have before us. Now that author is David, the eighth son of Jesse of Bethlehem, the sweet singer of the covenant people, the man after God's own heart, the king of Israel. And just as we look to God, fix our hope ultimately on God. So did David. And you have it in the psalm that is before us. I'm going to take us to that psalm, Psalm 16. I'm going to try and use, seems to be working, uh, my, my little computer up here. But Psalm 16, just the first verse, he says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. And so, again, our hope is David's hope. David's perspective was different. In fact, he was looking forward in time, anticipating the fulfillment of God's promises, and we look back on the soul-stirring events of the Messiah's life and death and resurrection, events which are, after all, the realization of that which David anticipated, I would suggest, with equal parts of excitement and wonder. And that distinctive perspective of David, that, as a matter of fact, that perspective of all the saints of all the ages before Jesus, that perspective which looked forward with wonder and anticipation to what we happily remember as sacred history, that's what I'd like to focus on for just a few minutes before we come to... Now, our, we're going to come to Psalm 16. We're going to get there. But uh, I'm going to take a few minutes to wander. I sometimes build a rather big porch for a little house, I like to say, but, <laughs> but we'll get there. But uh, uh, that's what, but, So we're headed for Psalm 16, and in fact, the Psalter, that collection of 150 uh, uh, songs breathed out by the Spirit and lived out by men in real life, is going to be the focus of uh, our summer series this year. Uh, the book of Psalms is the longest and the most complicated and by any measure the most popular, the most often appealed to and so on book in the Bible, both among Jews and Gentiles. Stunningly, there are in the New Testament over 400 either quotations or direct allusions to the book of Psalms. And there's one dynamic, I'm going to teach Bible survey here for just a minute, but there is one dynamic of the Psalms that is, is really important to understand. And that is the superscripts. 117 of the 150 psalms in our Psalter include a title, a superscript. Now, in the Hebrew canon, 
they are verse 1 of the psalm. In our English canon, they're appended as a note at the beginning. Frankly, there is some little discussion as to their, whether or not they are original. Are original? I think they are. And, uh, and, uh, but that's a, a discussion for another time, perhaps. But those superscripts always speak to one or more of three issues. And number one is historical setting. Now, that's rare. It's really helpful. When David tells us that he sang Psalm 18 after being rescued by God from the hand of Saul, that's helpful. But they're very rare. On the other hand, uh, another, another issue to which those superscripts address themselves are musical notations. And there are scores of those, but quite frankly, they are so lost in antiquity, uh, there's pretty much universal persuasion that it's impossible with any confidence to recover exactly what's at stake. But clearly, these psalms were intended to be set to me. They were, they were musically arranged. But the third issue to which the superscript addresses themselves is authorship. And uh, given the notations in the superscript, uh, the book of Psalms came together over a period of a, a millennium, about a thousand years, because the earliest psalm, as far as the authorial notation, is, the, is, is Psalm 90, which is penned by Moses. It was penned by Moses. That's 1400 B.C. And there are a number of psalms which are penned in the days of Ezra at the end of Old Testament history, about 400 B.C. So you've got this book coming together over a thousand years in stages, and, uh, uh, and, and, but the principal author is David. Seventy-three psalms are specifically identified as Davidic. Now, I like to think of the Psalms, and I invite you as well. The Psalms are prayers of praise and petition set to music and poetry. Prayers of praise and petition set to music and poetry. And by the way, both of those latter, the music and the poetry, are a sublimely beautiful and expert. Although sometimes it is a little difficult to appreciate that in English translation. But John Calvin spoke of the Psalms as the mirror, the mirror of the soul. And there is no human emotion which is unrepresented. And happily enough, because the human authors, and again, real men reflecting on real experiences in real life, but because those human authors were superintended by the Spirit of God in crafting those songs, we can trust the Psalms to teach us perfectly how to think, how to react, how to pray in every season of life. So it's certainly worthy to spend time uh, studying a few of these Psalms. And our focus is Psalm 16. Psalm 16 is a sublime song of a soul at rest. That idea, your soul is content, it's resting. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's, as I say, it's a sublime notion. And that's exactly what David is confessing <clears throat> here in Psalm 16. Now, uh, and, and let me just say real quickly, I think, this is a bit of an aside, uh, I think the best picture, I don't know if the best, but one of the really compelling pictures of what it means for God to put things at rest is Elijah in the, at Mount Sinai in 1 Kings 19. And you remember Elijah had won that victory at Mount Carmel and was outrunning the chariots of Ahab to get back at Jez, to Jezreel because he was so anxious to see Jezebel fall on her knees and say, what must I do to be saved? But when he got there, it didn't, didn't happen at all, and she threatened his life, and so he began running, and he doesn't slow down, and he gets all the way down to Mount Sinai. It takes him 40 days. Should have taken about four, but he was pouting all along the way. But at any rate, he got down there, and he complained to God that I alone still worship you and so on. And so God did something very gracious. He put, God, he, he put Elijah on the mountain, and as Elijah watched, first of all, you remember there was a, a wind that stepped there, and it broke the rocks, and then there was an earthquake, and then there was a fire. But after all those, and, and it says there was a wind, but the, but, but the Lord was not in the wind. And there was an earthquake. The Lord was not in the earthquake. The word was, and, and then it was a fire. The Lord was, but now, do you remember the Bible says that Elijah heard a still, small voice? 
And really what the Hebrew says is, Elijah was confronted with an audible silence. Think about that. After the wind, after the earthquake, after the fire, a quiet you can hear. Ah, what a delight. Now, Elijah wasn't convinced, but nonetheless, that picture, and I think that's the picture we ought to think of when, when, when Jesus stills the waves. This is the God who can put rest into the, into the most awful chaos. But I return to it. Psalm 16 is, is David singing a song of, of a soul at rest. But I'd ask the question, in fact, what was David trusting? I'm going to say again, his perspective is different than ours. So in what was David trusting? On what revealed truths had David set his confidence? Again, you and I have trusted in the finished work of Christ, his sacrificial death, his vindicating resurrection, those marvelous revelatory events which are recorded so perfectly in the Gospels, but those events were yet a thousand, a, 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 a thousand years in the future, in the days of David. And listen, God does, not, God does not demand that a person place his confidence in events, revelatory events, which have not yet happened. God does not ask a person to believe what he, God, has not yet said. Amen and amen. So at every point, so we're going to ask the question, and I'll be quick with this. Uh, what, what was the set of revelatory truths uh, redemptive truths in which David placed his confidence. And I think for that, we have to go back to Genesis chapter 3 and the Protoevangelium and the first breath of gospel truth. And I want to take you there. Uh, in, in, uh, let me go there. In, in Genesis 3, now I've got to be very quick with this, but you remember the scene. These are the last melancholy moments in the Garden of Eden because... Adam and Eve, having known what it was to walk in the cool of the day, have now with God and know that perfect fellowship for which God created them. Now they find themselves alienated from God, fearing God, angry with God. But God steps in. As soon as man rebels, God sets out to redeem. And God sets in and he calls together all the principal players in this sorry drama and God makes a promise. Now, interestingly, he doesn't make that promise to Adam and Eve. He makes it to Satan. And I think the point is that what God is saying to Satan is, this is not over. I am going to raise up a deliverer, and that deliverer is going to crush your skull. He's going to plant his boot on your, on your uh, slain head. So this is not over. I'm going to raise up a deliverer to deliver from the curse of sin and death. But Adam and Eve were really happy eavesdroppers. And uh, how their heart must have leapt when, to, to hear that, no, it's not over. Now, there's a lot more to say here, but I'm just going to stop with that, that what God does immediately is to promise that he's going to raise up a deliverer and that that deliverer is going to come from the seed of woman. Now, I want to go to another passage, and uh, sometimes things will show up on my screen here. And that's verse 21. And I know there are some who refuse to believe, who, who reject the idea that there's any real significance in this, but, but I absolutely insist there is. And in point of fact, you've got to understand, folks, the, the historical narrative of the Scripture is revelatory. The, the, the mighty acts of God are in, them, in and of themselves revelatory. And so what God does here on behalf of Adam and Eve is hugely instructive. All it says is, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Now, let me give you a, an insight with which you will not disagree. Those animals did not zip off those skins, all right? <laughs> so what we have here, now get it. What you have here is the shed blood of an innocent victim of God's provision. Which blood is intended to cover the wickedness of the guilty party? The shed blood of an innocent victim of God's provision. Now, I have a little chart, see if this works, but I want to I want to develop this just a little bit because it seems to me I'm asking a question. What was the basic body of revealed truth which was available to Adam? Yeah, I'm sorry, it was available to Adam and I believe he trusted it and accepted those coats of skin, but I'm I'm asking what what body of truth of revealed truth was available to David? 
Now, I'm going to say that these two basic, and I call them, and I don't know if this will even make any sense, but I like to call them two lines of salvation truth. Now, I'm going to develop that, but those lines are, first of all, a promise. And that promise is of a deliverer. And secondly, a provision. A provision of a sin offering which will cover your wickedness. Now, here's the point. Throughout the Old Testament, and by the way, that deliverer is going to be the seed of woman. And throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, and even uh, uh, going forward in the, in, in, in the New Testament, yea, verily, throughout the Scriptures, these basic, one might call them primitive, seed promises. Now, that's a little bit of a play on words because the one is the promise of a seed. But on the other hand, oh, be careful. Get out of here. I don't know what my computer's doing there. Uh, the ignore all the notes, okay? <laughs> the uh, I, honestly, goodness, uh, the the, the it, it's a seed promise, but these two salvific truths are seminal. They are the seed out of which everything else will grow. Now, my point is, oh nuts, what's going on here? <laughs> Worked so well in the last hour. Okay, uh, the. Uh, now, but the point is that this idea of a seed, somewhat primitive, is going to be developed and fleshed out and, and, and enlarged, and we're going to discover that not only is the promise deliverer the seed of woman, but also the seed of Abraham. And after that, not Ishmael, but the seed of Isaac. And after that, not Esau, but the seed of Jacob. And after that, not the firstborn, but the son Judah. And then after that, hugely importantly, of course, it's going to be the seed of David. Do you understand? That's the Davidic covenant. Now he's going to make appeal to this. Uh, in 2 Samuel 7, just rehearse it real quickly, David was now the king, and David understood, and it's so important to read this carefully into all your, uh, your, your understanding of the, of the monarchy in Israel. The human king was the lowercase k king, okay? The uppercase king was Yahweh. He was the king. He made himself that in 1446 at the foot of Mount, uh, Mount Sinai. But Yahweh never... He always administered his rule as king. And we're talking physical, real, literal king with a throne. Uh, it's called the Ark of the Covenant. I've told you before, probably, if I talk about the Ark of the Covenant, you're thinking about a really big boat. You need to spend more time in the Old Testament, I'm telling you. But anyway, so you, you've, you, he's got a throne. He's got a throne room. He, he, he invites his subjects to appear before him. So Yahweh is king, but he always administers his king through some human mediator, Moses, Joshua, the judges, and then the monarchy, and now David. And so David realizes that he's but the viceroy. He's but the representative of the real king who deserves all the glory. And David's heart is heavy because he has just finished a house, a palace, there in his newly won capital city of Jebus. And Yahweh, King Yahweh, has no home. And so he wants to build God a a house, a temple. He wants to build King Yahweh a house. And, and of course, King Yahweh demurs. And he says, no, not you, your son. And so, but he says, but I am going to build you a house. And then he makes a very simple, one-dimensional promise to David. He simply says, I will never do to your house what I did to Saul's house. That's the sum and substance of the Davidic covenant. David, I'm sorry, Saul had done wickedly for Samuel 13, for Samuel 15, and therefore his house had been taken from him. God had sought out a neighbor of his, a man better than he, and that man was David. And now David has become king, and God simply says, King Yahweh simply says, I will never do to your house. I'll never, if, if your son sins, I'll treat him like a child, I'll punish him, but I'll never do what I did to Saul's house. Now, from that, David necessarily, and we do as well, concludes happily enough that this long-awaited deliverer, first promise in Genesis 3.15, is going to be of the seed of David. Now, that's, that is the Davidic covenant. And, well, I'll just leave it at that. And, and, and not only with regard to the seed, we, so many ways we, we uh, find more and more about, we, we know more and more about this delivery. He's going to be born of a virgin. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. He's, 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 go, he's going to be despised and rejected. All of this is, but as, as, with all of that greater, further revelation, this basic reality that there is going to be a deliverer who is of the seed of woman is never compromised, never abandoned. And by the same token with regard to a provision, uh, th this blood covering, that 
grows. And, and, and for instance, just to, uh, we are told later on, we are told in the process of revelation, God insists that all of those sacrifices are made in a, in a central altar. Deuteronomy 12, the tabernacle and the temple. Uh, we're told that not just any patriarch is to offer sacrifices, but it has to be a certain family, the family of Aaron, of the house of Levi. And we're, as a matter of fact, we're, it, there is spelled out for us a huge Levitical system that is very specific about what animal is to be offered and what parts are to be offered on the altar and what season and so on. And, you know, one element of that instruction, I'm going to stop here just a moment. One element of that instruction that, that is, is uh, I'm testing, is... Uh, I think hugely instructive and, and much overlooked. I'm going to do this quickly. But, you know, in, in, in spelling out the Levitical system and specifically laying out what the sin offering, when you bring a sin offering, uh, that animal had to be, it's very specific. Matter of fact, here, just real quickly, I, can, I have it up here. Uh, in, in Leviticus chapter 4, it says again and again, uh, this is talking here about the, the common people. Lay his hand on the head of the sin offering. I'm going backwards here. When a ruler is sinned, notice, notice in the yellow, lay his hand. When the, when the congregation sins, the elders will come and lay their hands. And the word lay their hand does not mean just, it means to lean upon. It's a very, very strong word. And it means, that's why I was testing, it means to lean all your weight upon. And that's the picture. And I think the reason is, and I'm talking about the way in which this primitive offering, uh, the provision of a sin covering is fleshed out and enlarged and we understand more and more about it. And part of that is the teaching that when you bring a sin offering, you lean your weight upon it. You know what? The Levitical services were designed, all of those offerings and the, uh, so much, in, in all of its parts, it was designed to absolutely assault your physical senses. God wanted your attention. And so there are so many ways. And when you would bring a sin offering, you think about it, uh, and I think this applies to the Passover as well, but number one, every sense, you're, 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 when that, you're going to be resting on that lamb, and now the priest is going to come, and with one very deft and humane stroke, he's going to slit that lamb's throat. You're going to smell the blood as it's evacuated. You're going to hear the death rattle. You're going to watch as the eyes roll back. In the case of the Passover, you're actually going to go and eat some of that meat. But my point is you're leaning on him, so when he collapses, you're going to collapse with him. And you're going to have to get up and dust yourself off. Why would God put you through that? Because he's trying to teach you something. And that is two blessed lessons. Number one, the wages of sin must be death. God never had to deliberate that. That's a factor of his character. So there has to be death. But number two, that holy God who demands death for sin is also such a gracious God that he will provide an innocent victim who can die the death you deserve to die as long as you're willing to lay all of your weight upon him. So I'm saying that all of that is fleshed out in this, in this, uh, in, in, in this in, in, as we go forward in Scripture as to the, the number one, the promise of a deliverer, and secondly, the provision of a blood covering. Now, this is the question I want to ask. I'm going to manipulate this just a little bit. Uh, as we go forward in sin, you have these two, uh, in, in the Old Testament, you have these two lines of salvific truth. And when we come to the New Testament, we discover that there's but one line of salvific truth. In fact, the promised deliverer is also the ultimate sin sacrifice. Now, that's our happy possession. We understand that. And furthermore, oh, I better not go down that road, but, but there is so much excitement in that. This is what Paul exults over in, Gen in Romans 3 when he says that we now can understand how God can be righteous, how he can be just and the justifier of them that believe. I love that phrase. We can understand by reason of the finished work of Jesus Christ, the God-man who could offer himself up as, a, as, a, as, a, as an infinitely valuable atoning sacrifice and cover the infinite holiness of God. We, on this side of the cross, and that's my point, when did these come together? And I, when did we make, when, when did, did God make clear that in point, in fact, those two lines of salvific truth were one? And I would say it's only after the cross. 
that, that, that it's the cross that informs us, that helps us, under, that, that, that makes us understand that, as I say, the promised deliverer is also the sin sacrifice, and therefore, we understand how God can be just, absolutely true to his holy character, and the justifier proclaim righteous those who believe by reason of the fact that we are in Christ. All right, so I'm going to leave that alone. My point is simply this, that I think it's good. I'm going to take you to Psalm 16, and, and again, uh, uh, just with this much of a, of a background, that if we go back to David's day, here is what God had made absolutely clear. He made it at the very dawn of fallen human history, Genesis chapter 3. But it is the, the, the possession of David, and that is, first of all, that the wages of sin is death, and therefore there must be a blood covering. And secondly, that God has provided, has, has promised a deliverer who will, in fact, crush the skull of the tempter, and that the deliverer will come through the seed of woman, and then of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and now of David. So I would say that this is the stuff and substance of David's hope. Uh, he acknowledges that the blood offerings made yearly on the Day of Atonement are God's provision to cover his sin, and he looks longingly for the deliverer promised there in, in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. So, again, David's hope, and I'm going to take you to Psalm 16, and let me say again, David's hope was our hope, but his perspective was different. Uh, one more time, he was longing and expecting. We are remembering and delighting. Uh, for David, uh, in, in each case, our confidence is in what God has clearly revealed. For David, that was a promise first made in the Garden of Eden, recently made personal to him when God cut a covenant with David himself. And for us, it is all of that, plus the mind-numbing, soul-stirring events of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. So, I hope that's some help. In light of that fine-tuning, let me take you then to uh, Psalm 16. And I have a little outline. I'm going to work through the outline. I don't know if it's very helpful, but... Uh, it, as I say, it's, it's, it's really kind of a one-dimensional psalm. It's, it's, I got one-dimensional, that's, that's, but it's not real complicated. David is, is rejoicing over the, the uh, confidence that he has that he belongs to God and God is Yahweh, and, 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 and Yahweh will take care of him. So let me just take you to the psalm. Uh, notice it's called a miktam. Again, that's one of those musical notations or at least literary notations that we're very unsure of. Uh, there are six of them, this one and Psalm uh, 56 to 60. But, uh, uh, well, again, I don't know that we can make too much use of it. But notice in the, in the first two verses, we've already read these, or uh, uh, look to these, David expresses his confidence in the Lord for all the years of this life. And notice he says, preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. Now watch this. He says, oh, my soul, he gives us an in, kind of a, a window into the depths of his soul, and he says, you have said to the Lord. Now, notice the Lord there is Yahweh. It's those uppercase letters which signal that it is Yahweh. But then he says, I have said, I, my soul, you have said to Yahweh, you are my Adonai, my Lord, my master. And he is bowing the knee, and therefore he says, my goodness is nothing apart from you. I have no hope of satisfying uh, uh, your demands of, 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 of living a life pleasing to you apart from you. Now, I want to stop for a moment on that statement where he says, you are my Lord. In point of fact, listen, folks, we all agree, I think, that salvation is by grace through faith. But my concern is that I, I think we have done some little damage to, to, to the word faith, to the concept of faith. Because we regard it as something almost entirely abstract, maybe mental, metaphysical. It could not be more practical, real world, rubber hits the road concept, faith. And I think to understand that the best way, I think the best uh, uh, synonym to reflect what the Bible is talking about, that, that is synonym for the word faith, is allegiance. And, and I just invite you to ponder that because, uh, and, 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 well, I think it's born out of a very standard, normal 
uh, event, if you don't mind, in Old Testament, the ancient Near East of antiquity, and that is you'd have this wandering nomadic people, and they're constantly set upon by marauding kings, and they grow weary of it, and so they find themselves a king. Now, I like to say that most kings in the, in the Old Testament, most in antiquity, were kinglets. They weren't vast domains. They just had a walled city, which was the absolute be-all and end-all of security. You didn't have any security if you didn't have a walled city. So here's a king. He has a walled city. He has a little domain. And now there's people come to him, and they actually sign a treaty, and they become his vassals. And basically, they say, look, we're tired of being beset upon by all of these robbers and marauding uh, kings and so on. So we will become your vassals, your subjects, your servants, and number one, we will entrust, we will trust you to keep us safe. That's what it means. When you swear allegiance, when you exercise faith, you, 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 you determine that you will trust entirely that master to keep you safe. Now, let's just think real practically, what does that mean? Well, if you've genuinely trusted Jesus Christ to be your security, you're not going to trust your good works. You're not going to look to any sort of ritual or sacrament. All of that would put the lie to your claim that you're depending upon him for your security. Does that make sense to you? But not only do you look to him, I'm saying that when you give allegiance, first of all, you, you, you look to that king for security, that master, that lord, and number two, you obey what he demands. And so this simple reality of trust, do you see what I'm saying to you? That's as practical as it can possibly be. You're going to genuinely entrust him, uh, trust him for your security, and you're going to obey what he demands of you. And therefore, I think that's what he means when he says, I have said to Yahweh, you are my Lord. David is bowing his knee. He is swearing allegiance, and therefore he is entirely trusted. That's why he says, preserve me. I put my, my trust in you. But then David goes on to, in verses 3 and 4, to... Uh, to, to talk about his companions, which is really kind of curious here. Now, you ought to understand the situation, too, that David is the... Ooh, man, am I in trouble? Okay, I'm going to hurry. Uh, <laughs> David is the, is the, uh, is the king, and, and, and Yahweh is the ultimate king, but most of the people who live in that commonwealth, in point of fact, in their heart and home, are entirely rebellious. And so it's very important, David, to make the point that he is going to seek out as his companions because he has sworn allegiance to Yahweh. He is going to seek out those who are excellent ones, who are saints, who are holy ones, because he knows that their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I'll not offer and, uh, nor take their names on my lips. All he's saying is I will have nothing to do with those who worship these other gods. And listen, folks, really quickly, is there anything more practical in, in, in terms of living out the life God expects of us than the company we keep, for heaven's sake, the people to whom we gravitate, we ought to be so deliberate about it and so on. Is there anything more practical or more diagnostic of where your heart and life really is than, than the company you keep? So at any rate, it's interesting. This is a very practical uh, expression of praise. But then he says, he says, O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance uh, you maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. I have a good inheritance. Folks, real quickly. David is clearly picking up, he's making a word picture out of a very important event in Israel's history, and that is the division of the land after the conquest. After Joshua had, and the arms of conquest for seven years had gone out and totally destroyed the capacity of the Canaanites to defend themselves, then Joshua brought the elders together at a place called Shiloh, and there he divided the land among the 12 tribes. Five already had theirs, seven were given their inheritance. And the idea was, and in many cases it fleshed itself out this way, that the individual tribes tribes would go, they would complete the conquest of their territories, they would move in, they would settle. This was a land flowing with milk and honey, this was a good land, and that, and that they, would, they, would, they would settle in and say, our lines have fallen out in pleasant places. Our inheritance is a good inheritance. And David is making that a word picture for his own life. And let me just say, real quickly, folks, that David's delight the fact, it wasn't, as David surveyed his own life, it wasn't because there was, an, there was no trial or difficulty or danger, for heaven's sakes. There was plenty of that. 
And yet all of the trials and vicissitudes and dangers and, 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 and disappointments and blessings and victories and so on of life, you know what? All of that is ultimately very superficial to genuine soul contentment. And David knew that soul contentment because he had said, you are my Lord. Listen, it is such, it is the stuff of fallenness to, to long to rule our own lives. The Luciferian uh, 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 tendency, if you don't mind, the Luciferian wickedness, I'll be like the Most High. I will rule in my life. And, 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 and does God have a claim on your life? Absolutely. Is it odious? It is. No, because God puts you together. God knows how you are built. God knows that he has crafted you with a longing to know and enjoy him. And so, and God knows how to live, how to teach you to live skillfully. So the tendency to rebel and to, and to insist that we're going to live for ourselves uh, is so destructive. You hear what I'm saying? He, because he said, you are my Lord, he is able to say, my lines have fallen out in pleasant places. You know, Jesus articulated this four different times in his ministry, in four different situations. He said, the man who will save his own life will lose it, but the man who gives his life away for my sake and the sake of the gospel is going to find it. Is there anything more counterintuitive to the fallen nature? But that's exactly what God insists, and that's what David had discovered. Jesus, in another place, said, I love this, he said, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, a right relationship with God living according to his standards. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Finish it for me. For they shall be filled. He never says blessed are they who hunger and thirst after wealth or fame or money or entertainment or all the, 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 the uh, attractions of the world because you know what? They'll never be filled. Jonah says something that just strikes me. And I think every, you ought to memorize this verse and, and, and you know, <laughs> Be reminded of it day after day. Jonah says in the bottom, from the, from the belly of a fish, he says, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. God is so anxious to bless. God is so anxious to give you the kind of fullness and soul contentment that he promises you. But those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. So once again, I'm going to say it's because David says, you are my Lord, that here he says, my lines have fallen out in pleasant places. All right, very quickly. Uh, in verses 7 and 8, I'm not going to stop other than to say David acknowledges the importance of counsel in his life. And you know, David's life is fully recorded in Scripture, and we, we can trace it in Samuel and Chronicles, and, and we can trace the the, the, the various ways in which God provided counsel and direction and correction, whether it's prophets by the name of Nathan and Gad, whether it's the Urim and Thummim. Now, don't get me started on the Urim and Thummim. I wrote my dissertation on that. But, but it's a means by which, I like to say it's a red telephone. It's a means by which God, that God provided for David, by which David could consult directly, immediately with Yahweh. And then, of course, you have the informal, uh, you know, a, a volunteer counselor by the name of Hushai or a, 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 a wise woman by the name of Abigail. So in so many ways, God had surrounded David with the kind of counsel which is absolutely necessary to, to staying on the straight path, if you don't mind. So he rejoices over that. But then I want to go to the last three verses. With this, we're done. And we read these earlier. I'm not going to read them. But clearly what David is doing in verses 9 to 11 is rejoicing over his confidence in, in the life to come. Now, what's curious is that these, these words are twice quoted in the book of Acts, first by Peter and then by Paul. And, and in each case, the first Peter and then uh, I'm going to go to Paul first. But in each case... Paul and Peter each give us real insight into exactly what David is saying. So I think it's good to qualify our understanding by going to the New Testament remembrance of it. And very quickly in Acts 13, Paul is in Antioch of Pisidia on his first missionary journey. He is making the case that Jesus is the Messiah. And as he does that, he appeals first of all to Psalm 2, but then it says here in verse 15, uh, verse 35, he also says in another psalm, and he cites Psalm 16. But then he goes on to say, 
I've covered it there. For David, after he had served his own generation, by the will of God fell asleep and was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. So Paul is saying, now wait a minute. David insists that you will not allow my flesh to see corruption, and yet his body lays in a tomb. And by the same token, in, 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 in Acts chapter 2, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, uh, pursues the same argument. And he says, uh, I, again, he quotes him, and then I'm going to go down here to verse 29. He says, this is the day of Pentecost. He says, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Now, I, I think the case can be rather compellingly made that Peter preached this sermon from the southern steps of Herod's rebuilt temple. And those steps have been excavated, and we can stand there today, and we make the point when we were there that uh, Peter undoubtedly could have looked down south, down the hill to the, hill, to the city of David, and seen David's tomb. It was still there. So as he says this, he's probably pointing. And he's saying, we know that David is dead and buried, and there is his tomb. But then he says this, Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, he had sworn to David that of his, the fruit of his body, that's the, cup, the, the Davidic covenant, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ. Now, don't read Jesus into that, all right? David, when David says that, and what Paul is referring to, uh, David knows nothing of Jesus. He doesn't know that his name will be Jesus, that he'll be raised in Nazareth and so on. He's talking about the Messiah, the promised deliverer of Genesis 3 and beyond. So he says, David, being a prophet, knew that God would raise up the Messiah to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in, in Hades, his, uh, the grave, nor did his flesh see corruption. Now, very quickly, take you back to Psalm 16 and we're done. But my point is this, that, that both Paul and Peter are making the same argument. And that is that David could not have meant that his physical body would not rot in a grave. His body lay moldering in a grave even as Peter spoke. But David trusted the promises of his God. And he knew that the long-awaited seed of the woman, indeed David's seed, the fruit of his body, would conquer sin and death that that Messiah would rob death of its sting and the grave of its victory, and that he would make possible the resurrection of all God's people unto the eternal kingdom of our God and his Christ. And therefore, David's body would not forever suffer corruption. His soul would not languish forever. In the grave, he would be shown the path of life and ushered into fullness of joy, as he says, and pleasures forevermore, but only because he was trusting in that coming one who, in a drama of revelatory events that we look back upon today with wonder and delight, that one who would, in fact, be laid in a grave, but on the third day he would walk alive out of that grave, and then he would show himself alive by many infallible proofs for 40 days. So, David didn't know what God had not yet revealed, but he knew well and trusted entirely that which stood revealed, and namely that Yahweh, his Lord, was going to send a deliverer who would conquer sin and death. And thus David could rejoice in the hope of an eternal future, just as we do today. Listen, folks, know this. God doesn't whisper. God proclaims boldly and clearly the truth concerning himself and, and his dealings with men. Now, he's revealed himself progressively. In, in stages throughout much of history. And at every stage, man is responsible as a steward to bow the knee to that revelation which has been given in all of its parts. But from the beginning of fallen history, God has made clear the promise and the provision which men must embrace in order to be right with Him. And at every stage in the progress of revelation, at every, in every age, in David's day and in ours, God invites men to simply trust in the deliverer he has promised and the sin covering he has provided. We know that we have all of that in Jesus Christ. And thus we with David can sing with delight a song such as his, a song of a soul at rest. Music